Kurt, for this week's PBT Extra, we got to start with one of the biggest marquee matchups, Phil, uh, Philadelphia versus Milwaukee. And it came down to the final second or so where Giannis, in what was a, a splendid performance, a 40-point, 14-rebound, 6-assist game, had the game-winning block to seal the game against Joel Embiid. What were your takeaways as the Bucks walked away 118-116? to 116? First, man. A, that block is amazing, right? Like that block, the rebound, like how fast he got up there on that was incredible. I, that's that's not just MVP, but like how many guys have that kind of bounce? Like, and it can actually get to that. Spot. Second, the I think what was maybe the most fun part of this game is it because it felt like a playoff atmosphere. These are two teams battling for position in the top of the East. The Stars brought it. Like you, you mentioned the great numbers for Giannis, and, and he was – he probably was the better player of the two that night, but Embiid had a big night. Like Embiid and took over. He was the guy with the ball in his hands in the fourth quarter, willing the the uh, the Seventy Sixers on. Like it was a great performance for him. But I, I will say that this was my one big takeaway when kind of sat back after watching it, thought about it for a second. I think the Seventy Sixers played closer to their peak potential mm. than the Bucks did. Like I think the Bucks have. Like, it was not a great Drew Holiday night. He got blown by by Shake Milton at points, like, and he's better than that. I, I think there's another gear or two for the Bucks, and that was a really good James Harden performance until like he, he did go one of four in the fourth. But like, it was a good James Harden night, and they played pretty good defense, and they got their pace up. And I, I a couple nights before, I'd seen Doc Rivers, and he'd said to me, "Like, we're not there yet. We're not ready." They blew the Clippers out, but he's like, "Look, we're not executing at the level we need to." I thought they got closer to that, and they still couldn't win this game. Yeah, what what does that say about this Philadelphia? With, with James Harden playing, like you said, 32 points, it, it's with them playing this way, Tobias Harris adding in 22 points, and it's still not enough yeah. to beat the Bucs. It's got to be concerning. I, I I still think right now the Bucs might, with, with the way Miami is stumbling, uh, with Boston, you know, and we'll talk about all this stuff, struggle with the Bucks are probably going to be my pick to come out of the East, but that kind of confirmed it. Cause I still don't, like I said, is I still think that wasn't their best effort. I think that they can be better than the team we saw in that game. And they still, Hey, fourth quarter, let's flip the switch. Let's go get the win. And they did. And we've seen that time and time again with this Bucks team. And I think that is what separates. I think you have that, that coolness factor of yeah. we just, we're the defending champs. <laughs> do, do you know who we are? <laughs> you know, and, and that kind of feeling, whereas the, the 76 are still in beats trying to get his first MVP. Giannis is like, I'm on track to three, you know, he's a, Giannis is already this one of the 75 greatest players ever played the game. And he's the same age. Uh, I think he's a year younger than Joel is. Right. So like you think about the confidence that the Bucks have, it, it showed in this critical moment. And this is just a one game performance on an off night. Right. Whereas the the 76ers are, are kind of searching for answers here. Imagine over the course of a seven game series. Now you can't extrapolate too much, but just yep. that coolness factor of saying, Hey, we've been here. We've done it. We were, you know, all the pressure's off our shoulders. Uh, Philadelphia's got to figure it out. Like we're the defending champs. And I think it showed out very clearly in that game towards the end. Uh, is there more pressure heading into the playoffs on anyone other than James Harden in the league? Like after that trade, after everything he's done, I think, and the fact that he hasn't had great playoffs in the past, like I think there's a genuine pressure on him to perform in this one. I would agree. I think there's a tremendous amount of pressure on James Harden, given the circumstance. I would also say, and I think Damian Lillard has a tremendous amount of pressure on him as well. Um, but obviously, you know, he's not playing right now. But just in generally, this kind of moment where, you know, what, what does Damian Lillard bring to a franchise? Just like we're asking the same question, what does James Harden bring to a franchise? Now is kind of the proofs in the pudding. You know, we've seen it in Houston. We've seen it in OKC. We've seen it in, in Brooklyn. You know, can you win or not? And and the Philadelphia 76ers, this is the moment. Joel Embiid's playing at an MVP level, and James Harden is largely unstoppable, and he has been for the past few years. If you two, in your prime, with a supporting cast, like I said, Tobias Harris and Tyrese Maxey, Matisse Teibel, <laughs> if your supporting cast and a championship coach and, and coach and Doc Rivers can't win a championship, then I think that is is a pretty clear statement on what you know, what you bring to the franchise. Uh, and I think, like, like I said, an aside, I think the second player with the most pressure in my mind would be Damian Lillard moving forward, uh, not this year, but moving forward without CJ McCollum because yeah. the arc of the entire franchise has been built around him. He's been the sun. He's been the solar system. You know, he's like, it's his solar system, right? 
and if it doesn't work when he's healthy and playing well as one of the 75 greatest players of all time, they're going to have to figure something out. So those two players in my mind have the most pressure. Would you say anyone else on that list? No, I don't. I think that that I look to me hard and far and away. There's, there's, everybody's got some pressure when you get into the postseason, right? There, there's, there is some pressure on Kyrie Irving. There is some pressure on, but, but he's also got a ring, right? And he's they, like, there is something to fall back on there. But I think there is pressure on um, some teams, you know, a little on Steph Curry and and maybe more even more on Draymond Green. Like, can you get this back together? There's some pressure on Chris Paul to finally take that one last step. But I don't think any of it compares to what, like, legacy-wise, it means a lot to Harden. It means a whole lot. Yeah, we know how tremendous he is as an individual player. Basically, every accolade you can, oh, you can yeah. rack up, the last one that has been so elusive has been this team um, accomplishment. I want to take your uh, attention to Boston because this is one of those teams where we saw a flash of greatness in the Eastern Conference Finals. We saw what they could do. And uh, it looks like, Kurt, it looks like they're back on that type of trend. Uh, but, of course, heading into the most pivotal part of the season, another setback. And this is a big one. Robert Williams III, knee injury. He's out indefinitely. What's your takeaway from that from that injury? Yeah, he had surgery. It's four to six weeks now that the, the team announced. If you want to play, the, that could have him back for the conference finals game. You can. But he they've got to be there at that point. And I think it's a challenge. He's just... Look, their defense is better with him on the floor, much better. And, and they went and at the time they got Daniel Teese at the at the trade deadline, there was a lot of like, do they really need that? Do they? Yeah, now they do. Like that <laughs> that insurance plan is really paying off. But he's still not the same. He's solid. Like he's a nice, solid NBA center. But Robert Williams makes their defense go because they can they can almost switch one through five. Like he can change out on the perimeter. He, he's not a great scorer in, inside. Like, he's not, you know, Rudy Gobert, we kind of don't think of it. But, like, Rudy Gobert has got great hands, finishes whatever you throw to him. That's not really where Williams is yet. But he's good enough. Like, he's enough of a threat you've got to watch him. But his defense just – he takes their defense with – I mean, Marcus Smart, who's, fan, you know, amazing at the point, And you've got good defenders in Brown and Tatum out on the wings. That takes the whole thing to another level. And – I really think it comes down to matchups for them now, doesn't it? Like, there are certain teams where not having that switchable fifth guy, Miami can be a problem with Bam Adebayo. Uh, the Bucks are going to be a problem for everybody. You might be better off, <laughs> you know. But yeah. again, but if you land, it depends on who you land in the first round. You don't want, obviously, nobody wants Brooklyn. But like, if you get Cleveland and they're a little banged up, you might be able to kind of get through that and get to the second round and. If if you get the 76ers, who's look and beads more of a straight up matchup, right? Like I can put Tice on him and, and body and put big bodies on. It's a little more straightforward how you handle them. So I think it's going to be interesting. It really just comes down to matchups. I still think they can make it through, but they might have been my favorite a week ago, and they're not now. Such as the NBA, right? I mean, it's yeah. just crazy right now in the Eastern Conference because we just looking at these standings really quick. We're paying so much, or just, we're paying so much attention to them because right now it's, I mean, playoffs are April sixteenth, and you look at the top three; they're all game apart. <laughs> the Heat, Bucks, and Celtics. It's like one game back. So, and then of course the 76ers in the four spot. Guess what? They're two games back. You know, yeah. so at any given moment, any given day. Heading down the stretch, one through four is just completely up in the air. And don't forget about the Bulls, right? Four games back, and they had a, a, a moment when they were, you know, king of the court for a while. Uh, but yeah, going back to Robert Williams, for me, there's you know a couple different echelons there, and I think he fits into that. You're getting a double double from him, kind of like a Dwight Powell kind of guy, right? Where you're playing alongside Luca, you're playing alongside Jason Tatum. You don't need to be Rudy Gobert, you don't need to be Nikola Jokic, but what you do for us is valuable and how valuable let's put some numbers to it you know he just signed a four-year 54 million dollar contract so from my perspective i think he adds in you know a very big part of the celtics team but obviously it's just understanding your role and, ex and excelling in it and i think that's what's so interesting about the celtics team kurt like you said a week ago they could have been your favorites is that they're pinpointing positions right like like marcus smart like he knows exactly what he's, what he's good at and he's very very good at that thing Robert Williams III, accepting that role. Jason Tatum, obviously doing what he does as a franchise player. Uh, so I love how they built the team, and now it's just pinpointing. But, man, the way that this Eastern Conference has fallen out and shaken out, it's just it's, 
any given day. What's the best uh, matchup, do you think, team-wise, uh, that, that you would expect them to see? Well, you know what's interesting? You're hearing rumblings now that, that and and more somewhat from other teams speculating, but like, are you better off being the three or four and avoiding Brooklyn than being the one or two and getting Brooklyn in the first round? Mm-hmm. Like, it, the Nets, and I think all of, look, I think every one of those teams that you were talking about, the six, Sixers might be the worst matchup for them. They, like, they, they might want to avoid them more than others, but I think if you're the the Heat or the Bucks or who or Celtics, you believe you can beat. The, the, Brooklyn hasn't proven they can defend. You believe you can beat them. They got Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Like <laughs> you are going to struggle to beat them. It is going to be a lot of work. They are going to put up a lot of points. They are going to win a couple games at least in a series because they're so because their offense is so good. And I believe they could actually pull an upset. Like mm. I don't think they can pull. Three up, you know. I don't think they could pull off enough upsets in a row to make the finals. But if you told me that they upset somebody in the first round, like they got Kevin Durant, man. Yeah, they can upset somebody. <laughs> in the first round. So, like I think it's an interesting debate. Like, would you rather dodge them a little? Are you worried enough about the matchups? I like. I don't think the Bucks care. I think the Bucks will be like, yeah, bring it on, whatever. They did that last year. Remember, there was t- they actually had a team meeting about whether to tank or go through and face the Heat in the first round because they'd had trouble with them. They said, "Look, bring on the Heat. We got we got to go through our we got to go through our problems." But I'm not sure every team feels that way. Very important. We'll see how that plays out. I, I want to bring your attention. You mentioned Brooklyn and Kyrie Irving. He has played in a home debut this season, which at the beginning of the season was unlikely, yeah. and now we're almost two weeks, a little over two weeks away from the playoffs. Uh, what do you think about his home debut, and what does this mean for the Nets going into playoffs? It just makes them more dangerous, right? Because Kyrie Irving, he, that home debut, he put up 30-whatever-it-was. Like he, I mean, he's fun to watch, isn't he? Like His ability to just create off the dribble and create space and find teammates, set other guys up. But he's just – nobody kind of has his handles and his isolation skills at the guard. Like Nobody's quite like him. They are far more dangerous with him. But I, the other thing I would take away from that first game, they lost. They lost to the current nine seed, like one of the teams in the plan with them in Charlotte. They still can't defend. And that's I, I, what I think ultimately does them in, whether that's the first round of the playoffs or the second or wherever. I just don't think they're going to defend well enough through all those rounds. Somebody's going to get to them. But they're, any given game, any given series, like that's a problem. Kyrie Irving is a problem. And you combine him with Kevin Durant, that's an offensive it's an offensive force, man. Yeah, and then that loss against Charlotte, it's interesting because Kyrie's numbers were surprisingly inefficient, right? I mean, one from nine yeah. from the three-point. You look at his past five games, he's shooting over 50% for the most part over three-point. You know, one for nine is uncharacteristic. Uh, he walked away with 16 points in that debut, but uh, followed up with a 24-point 24, 24 yeah. performance, which is much more characteristic of what we see from Kyrie, but still inefficient from the floor. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think, as like you said, when we go into playoffs, what was the most important question way months ago when we, when we first talked about this? It was, can Brooklyn's big three, you know, have time together? Last year, we did not see that, right? And it showed in the playoffs. And then this season, it was a different reason. James Harden leaves. Kyrie can't play at home. And then now you're entering into playoffs in the same scenario, yeah. basically, right? Where it's like, do they have time together? So it is, it's a very fast, and Ben Simmons is he going to come back? Is he not? You know, what have you heard there? When when is the timetable? Uh, he he has not done any on court work. He got an epidural in his back. He's still not doing work. They won't rule him out because it's coaching and sports, right? Like they're trying to stop. Us. I'd be shocked if he came back at this point. And talk about the guy they really need. Because what are we talking about with them? They need defense, yeah. a little more playmaking, somebody who can move the ball in transition. Kyrie can do it a little. He fills so many needs for them and and it could be on paper it looks great but um he's got to get on the court and i'm not i'm not sure if we see at this point never say never but I, I can't imagine he comes back and then finds a way to fit in comfortably that fast and that just bolsters you know the point that i just made it's just like the past two years the ton of talent yeah expect you know expectations are through the roof everyone's almost like oh man when is brooklyn going to win a championship but the fact that there's just a lack of time, it's time together on the court. It, who knows how it's going to translate last year. If we've learned anything, it does not translate well. 
uh, despite all of that talent. So now I'm going to bring you into the Eastern Conference. Let's just take a look one through 10 really quick. I'm just going to read them off real quick. Um, and then you tell me what jumps out to you, who's going to take a top, and then the most interesting matchups. You ready, Kurt? Yeah. Okay. One, Heat. Two, Bucks. Three, Celtics. Four, 76ers. All within two games. Yeah. Then five, the Bulls. Six, Raptors. Seven, the Cavs. <laughs> They're all within two games of each other. And then 8, 9, 10, it goes Nets, Hornets, Hawks, also within two games. And when I look at this, this, rem this reminds me of uh, way back when, uh, where you look at the Western Conference, and it was like this, right? Now you look at the Western Conference, and it's like there's a huge drop-off. The Eastern Conference is now the stronger conference, top to bottom. And it looks like at any moment, these can just shuffle in those four groups, one through four five through seven, eight through 10. How do you think it's going to, the shuffleboard is going to end? Yeah. I, I got a feeling the Bucks get the number one seed. We'll see. I mean, I just think that they're playing better than the other teams at the top, but it's so close. And there's only, you know, as of us talking, their teams have six, seven games left. There's not much time. So it can kind of shake out anyway. I, I just mentioned, you know, the teams might want to avoid Brooklyn. Do you want to play Toronto right now? Like <laughs> the Raptors are playing good basketball, Corey. Yeah, three wins, three uh, win streak right now. It's it looks like they're trending upwards. Yeah, Pascal Siakam has really come on this year, kind of quietly. Nobody's seen it. Um, they roll out a really interesting lineup, and it's sort of what the Celtics do, but a little different. In that, I mean, it's Fred Van Vliet, who's a gritty, tough guy, and then everybody else is six seven through six nine, and we'll switch everything, and we're long, and we're athletic, and we're just tough to play against. We don't play like other teams. Uh, I think that that maybe you figure it out over the course of seven games, but I think that they're a difficult matchup for a lot of teams. They're just not going to be an easy out. And by the way, they have this, if you're Kyrie Irving or some other potentially unnamed, um, unvaccinated person, you can't go to Canada. You're not allowed in, right? Like it's a, if somebody's unvaccinated in that series, we'll find out pretty fast because they, they can't travel to Canada it could be a weird home court advantage that way. And just to you know, remind everyone out there, the, the, the league vaccination rates are extremely high, oh, yeah, but there yeah. are in these scenarios where this could be one of one, one, one issue heading into playoffs in, in a crucial time. But yeah, five through seven to me, I'm with you. All, all those teams, I mean, the Bulls sat at top of the Eastern Conference for a while there. The, the Cavs did too. They were in, within spitting distance towards the top for a while there. And they have some confidence around Darius Garland and, and Evan Mobley. And from my perspective, any of those teams yeah. upset territory, right? I mean, you're looking at a pretty yeah. interesting series. Yeah, the Cavs in particular, if they can just get healthy. I mean, they've stumbled lately. Garland's continued to play great. But what they've missed is uh, Jared Allen's been out with a broken finger. Evan Mobley rolled his ankle the other night. He's going to miss a little time. If they get those two guys back, their defense suddenly just anchors down again. And, yeah, they're a tough out. And then eight through nine uh, – sorry, eight through ten – um, what, what's your take on the Hawks? Because re remember, last season we saw uh, looked like Trey Young's coming out party on the biggest stage, and now they're sitting, you know, at, at the ten spot, looking into playing games. What are your expectations for this team going forward? You know, though, I don't know if I want to see them in the playoffs again for this reason. Trey Young loves that spotlight. We saw it during the season, right, when he goes to Madison Square Garden and just has a monster night. He loves the big stage. He loves the big moment. And, and he's actually put up really nice, like all NBA level. I don't know if he's going to make the team. He's kind of one of those bubble guys, but he's an all NBA numbers over the course of the season, but you get him in those big moments and he shines. And that's by the way, what makes them a dangerous playing team, right? Oh, Hey, winner, go home one game. I wouldn't mind having Trey Young in my corner for win or go home one game, right? So I think that they're in that way dangerous. I don't know if they can put it together for seven against any of those top four teams. It really wouldn't matter. But on any given night, man, Trey. Yeah, I think that's – just looking at playing right off the top, 9-10, Hornets, Hawks. Yeah. Lamello, Trey, to me, that's probably the most exciting one. Let's go to the Western Conference. This is a little different. As I mentioned – it's a weaker conference this year, which uh, is really interesting to see the trends of the NBA play out before our eyes. But Phoenix is, I mean, it's a top-heavy conference. Phoenix is the best team in the NBA. I mean, the way that they're playing, eight-game win streak, it just seems like they've separated themselves, you know, quite quite far from everybody else. 
Then it goes Grizzlies, Warriors. Uh, Grizzlies also looking good on a, on a five-game win streak. But then this is where it gets interesting in my mind, right? Like three through seven, four through seven. When you talk about Dallas, the way that they're playing, the Jazz, don't forget the Jazz, you know, Nuggets with Jokic putting up better numbers this year than last year when he won MVP. And Carl Anthony Towns and the Timberwolves. Well, I mean, what do you think about that midsection of the Western Conference? You've got, you're right. You've got teams trending in different directions, right? The Warriors are struggling right now because Steph Curry's out. Like their offense just comes apart when he's out. Draymond also, and he, Draymond was hard on himself the other night after a game. He hasn't been quite himself. I, I still think his back might be bothering him a little. We'll see. He hasn't been quite himself, but until they get Curry back, which they should for the playoffs, they're vulnerable. Meanwhile, Luca's putting up Luca numbers. Like they're, they're, Dallas is playing really well, and it gets interesting, doesn't it? Because then you get to Utah. They're in their own heads right now. They remember they blew a twenty-five point lead last night. Or, uh, you know, we have, we're taping this on Wednesday. On Tuesday, blew a twenty-five point lead to the Clippers, and and came from in the third, like and came from ahead to lose. Paul George comes back. He looks great, but after the game. Rudy Gobert was saying, man, this is the same, us making the same mistakes over and over again. Uh, Donovan Mitchell was actually swearing during the pre- post game press conference, which is not really a Donovan thing. Like, he's not that guy. They're clearly frustrated and a little bit in their own heads over their current losing streak. And where is a week and a half left in the season? Like, it's, it's a bad time to be in your own head and, and kind of struggling like that. Yeah, I mean, it is uh, it is interesting. I think you can see two different ways, right? You can see it almost like how Duke in March Madness, you lose on senior night to North Carolina, you lose to Virginia Tech in the ACC championship game, right? And then what happens? You go to the Final Four. You know, do you turn yeah. it around? Do you take this and say, good thing we got all – like South Carolina was the same way, right? They lost yeah. the SEC championship game. And, they, and then Don Staley did the press conference said, good thing we got the loss out now. <laughs> and I think that's kind of the way I look at the Jazz is – if they can get through this rough period, it's five games in, in the losing streak. You have two different things. You can either, one, just continue to let it snowball, which we've seen so many times happen in professional sports, that trend go on. Or you can use this and say, good thing we got our five losses out now be, before these seven games, best of seven game series. Um, so I can see it either way. And the way that Quinn Snyder runs that team, the way that the Jazz operate, I personally am more towards a, they'll figure it out. But those those comments you mentioned, you know, they are – they're very vulnerable at the current moment. And in that Western Conference spot, you're talking about five games separating, you know, the, the Timberwolves and the Warriors, which I wouldn't count the Warriors, like you said, not in that group. I think they're the top, you know, the cream of the crop, and just, just like you said, once they get everyone back. But uh, but Dallas, like Denver, Minnesota, I think is going to make a run for it. This is going to be pretty interesting. What do you think now Paul, uh, Paul George back with the Clippers, how does that change their fortune? I don't know if it changes it completely, but – it becomes a much tougher out, right? That's already – Tyron Lue said, I, you know, I was at the game Friday night, and he was – after the game, he was just like, we're a little worn down. We're a little mentally – like, they all season long, they had been so efficient, so disciplined, so – and they just kind of got to a point where I think it, the length of the season and everything they'd done, they needed a morale boost. Paul George comes back, and they looked – you know, in the second half, they came back from 25 points down again, which the Clippers have now done, by the way. They've had four 20-plus point comebacks this season. Like, those guys just don't roll over. They're, they've they got all these veteran role players. Like, I think that they're, again, I don't think they win a first game. They come out as the seven or eight seed, depending on what happens in that first game, probably the eight. And they get, they're not beating Phoenix in the first round. They're not going to beat Memphis in the first round. They're not good enough. They don't have that much talent with that. But George makes it more realistic and makes the upset possible. You can just ask the Utah Jazz about that. Yeah, in the first quarter, this was just crazy. The Utah Jazz scored 32 points. They were just making yeah. everything from beyond the arc. The Clippers had 14 points, 14 as a team in the first quarter, and still came back and win that game. So, yeah, that tells you kind of where they are as a team as far as just like that, that fight that want to. But I got to ask you, I feel like every week we talk about the Lakers. It's hard not to. Um, they're out of the play-in right now. So when you look at the play-in, the Spurs are in the 10th spot. The Lakers are in the 11th. And going forward, 
they don't have the best record against the teams that they're playing. Do you think they get in? Uh, you have any Spurs clothes I can borrow so I can jump on the bandwagon, <laughs> man? Do you have any extra Spurs gear I can get? Um, I I think that Spurs are in. I think that they're going to finish. And I, you mentioned part of it. A, LeBron James and Anthony Davis remain out. LeBron, look, Anthony Davis, they're saying Friday night against the Pelicans and what's a big showdown game if you're going to make it. You're the Clippers. If you're the Lakers, I should say. I kind of think you've got to beat the Pelicans at home on Friday because you mentioned the other real problem they have, even if they get healthy. They're marquee TV games, and people are starting to really pay attention to the NBA heading into the playoffs. So they're, they have this loaded schedule of big games on television. So, you know, they were on against Dallas the other night when just getting crushed because they didn't have anybody there. Um, their schedule is loaded. They, I think they have Oklahoma City, and they have the Pelicans in what's a, a pretty even matchup. And then that's it. They're, they're, they're stacked after that. Like, everybody else is good. They're going to be, it's going to be hard pressed to come up with enough wins because they can't tie the Spurs. The Spurs have the tiebreaker. They have to get in front of them. Your Spurs are playing pretty good basketball, man. Jajante Murray is real. Yeah, I see. I think this is, I, I see two different things. Let's start with the Spurs. I was thinking to myself, after Keldon Johnson was a part of the Olympic team, won gold this past mm-hmm. summer, I was like, okay, this is going to be a pretty interesting opportunity. One, to learn from the best people in, in, in the world at what they do, right? So hopefully, then as a young player that teaches you, okay, this is what it takes to be a champion, to be you know the best in our league and to be the best in the world. And we didn't see that translate at first, at the beginning of the season, which in, opened up the the, route, the the road for DeJounte Murray to kind of take over really. And then like he got his first all-star game. So now you have DeJounte oh, and also the team. Did you see the way they rallied around Coach Pop when they got yes. him that win? Like he said, like, I want to do this for Coach Pop. He deserves it. So th- this moment here of, okay, we love playing here. We love playing for our coach. We're trying to make history for him. DeJounte Murray's in all-star form, and his confidence is, is getting higher and higher and higher. Keldon Johnson has the physical skill set and, you know, the, the just access to the, the, the game's great, and hopefully all these things can come together at the right time. I think they're in the same position as John Moran and the Memphis Grizzlies were last year when they had, we saw that playing game that just like made everyone say, if you hadn't been watching Memphis, Hey, watch Memphis. Right. I think this is where we are with the Spurs. Obviously, you know, John Morant's like a very, very special player who knows whether DeJounte Murray will grow into that, but nonetheless, seeing an all-star having his, his coming out party in a playing game, uh, I think this is going to be where the Spurs separate themselves and, and give people a lot of hope for the future. Yeah, no, I think that I think that they they're building something solid there, and and I was I for a while I mean I don't know if they've got the real stars they need. Like it's a solid group of role players, but but Dejounte Murray is becoming. He was an all star this year, and and deservedly so. Um, I think they are building something there, and I just think they're in a good spot, and they're rolling, and the Lakers are. Well, if they're rolling, it's it's the wrong direction. Yeah, and that, that's the problem with the Lakers. Like uh, Coach Vogel was saying, every game we've no we look at the schedule. They're all basically playoff games for us. The intention needs the intensity needs to be higher. It's a different level. And then you see that game against the Mavs, where Luka Doncic had a triple double in three quarters. A third, like, like, what? And then you see, okay, well, LeBron James and Anthony Davis are both sitting in what is considered a playoff game. Yeah. And, you know, Russell Westbrook's comments after the game were like we're changing nothing. Like, I don't know. It seems like to me, it's like we're, we're it seems like it's kind of this. The season's over with uh, that's kind of the, the the vibe that I got from just watching, you know, body language and watching the game. It, it seems like everyone's ready to to just move on and call this one quits. Yeah, we were talking about that other team that plays down the hall from them and, and how much fight they've got and how much they want to and how much. Ty Lue has brought them together as a unit. Do you get that vibe from the Lakers? No, especially when you say this is a, a playoff type of game, like every game coming forward in the next six, seven games are playoff level, and then your two best players where we know the Lakers are not very good without Anthony Davis, and they're not very good without LeBron James. You, they're, not, they're like very, very not very good. They're not very good at all without both of them. So it's almost like that's that's – the response to the the play in kind of playoff mentality hey. it seems like there's just no fight there kurt right and you look at the look the suns went 10 and 4 without chris paul 
the Grizzlies are 18 and two without jaw this year. Like they rally the best teams find a way to rally and win without their stars. And the Lakers do not. Okay. Last but not least, let's do some PBT picks. Okay. So are you more excited to watch the young players trying to make, you know, make, make a name for themselves in this play in game or in the playoffs or the vets, any star matchups that you want to see? Actually, you, you touched on it earlier. You know what I first looking for? I think it's the young guys for me. And first one I'm looking forward to is playing in the East, man. I want Trey Young and LaMelo Ball head to head one game. Loser is in, losers in Cancun. That didn't sound that bad, really. But loser goes home. Winner, um, you know, winner advances. Like, I'm excited about that. Like, if that's the matchup, and I don't, I think Brooklyn's good enough to get the eighth seed. Like, they're, they'll, string together the wins i'm excited about that one and then out west it's assuming that the timberwolves finish seventh and then beat the clippers probably it will be the eighth in that playing game uh which is a little bit of an assumption but i really want the job morant at carl anthony towns matchup and that's not really obviously head to head Jaden mcdaniels but you get anthony dave um, i mean anthony edwards on jaw little and desmond bain in there I want those two young teams. I want to see which young stars step up. We know Jaw has. We watched Jaw beat Steph Curry in the play-in game last year, right? Like, I want to see the next evolution of them for that. So it's the young guys. I mean, at the, I'm not worried about seeing some of the old heads. <laughs> Chris Paul will be there at the end. We probably will see Giannis Antetokounmpo or, or some other veterans near the end, you know, as we get deep in the playoffs. But that first round, I'm kind of excited about seeing where the young guys go. Uh, yeah, I can't you? blame you. Yeah, I, I mean, I told you I love the Spurs. I'm excited where the team is going in the future. It looks promising. But I'm going to go veterans, actually, Kurt, because for me, let's start with um, – let's just start with the West since we're, we're over here. I want to see Clay. Like, I want to see the Warriors of old. Like, it's interesting because you see these moments of dynasties, like one of the most feared dynasties in recent memory in the NBA. You always have that question of, can you run it back? Like, what if, what if you had all of us still in our in our prime? Can we still do what we once achieved? And I think you're seeing a Warriors team with like not only the fun that we see them play with, you know, it's like trademark Warriors, but also with a little bit of like a, like an edge, you know. And like this season, there were moments where I was like, "You're playing like you have something to prove, Steph, and all these you know, like, yeah. you just, like you just got the all time three point score, like you know, like you're already the all time three point leader in NBA history, like." Draymond is, you know, doing all like, so my point is that like, you've already proved everything, but yet it feels like this team is still a little edgy. And I like that. I, I want to see this Warriors team. Um, I don't know, just yeah. see if they can get close to where they were before. And the other one, um, the other one I want to look at is the Bulls because DeMar DeRozan, we talked about the Renaissance he's had. He's continued to elevate his game year after year. And, you know, he mentioned that his time in San Antonio was very beneficial for him. And, and you can see that play out. I'm curious to see where the Bulls franchise goes from here, right? Like with Zach Levine, his contract talks with DeMar DeRozan. Like I, that to me is going to be interesting because I think this is when some decisions are going to be made. And and I just, and I just as a fan of basketball, um, a good Bulls team is always a good thing for the NBA. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited to see them in the playoffs. And by the way, they got a young guy in Patrick Williams. I'm curious to see what he looks like in the postseason, too. 